this type of test, all of these listed here, are done in exactly the same way in the laboratory. However, they have very different clinical implications. So what will we expect a diagnostic test to tell us? A genetic diagnostic test. Okay. So with a diagnostic test, we have a clinical picture. There's something wrong. And then we do a test to confirm that. It doesn't tell us anything new, it confirms it or it disproves it. Okay. What would the predictive test tell us for that patient? Predictive test like something like this or something. Okay, so what would be different with that scenario? This one, a predictive test that he will not have the sign of the disease, but you can predict which like and then can disease will be 100 percent mm -hmm. so after 40 years that he can get the disease. Okay, fantastic. So with predictive testing, the individual is usually asymptomatic. It gives us future health-related information for that individual. Carrier testing? Okay, for the most part for recessive, all excellent. And again, most of the time, bearing a few exceptions in an asymptomatic individual. It has no health implication risk, but it may have implications for children. Okay? They have a health history and all that disease. They have history of that disease. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, yes. They may be. Perhaps the population may be at high risk. So for the European population, we even if there was no family history of cystic fibrosis, we would consider carrier testing because that condition is very prevalent in the population. Okay. So yes, sometimes there will be a family history, but not in every scenario. Prenatal testing in pregnancy. Okay. So it will tell us about that fetus, affected or unaffected, at risk or not at risk. And pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, we were chatting about that a little bit this morning. Okay, so testing prior to falling pregnant and then basing the decision of which developing cells would be implanted into the uterus. Okay. All right, so we've mentioned a few examples of um, predictive testing, Huntington's disease being one of those cases. Can we think of a few others? Okay, so for cancers, which are the ones we primarily deal with? Okay, the BRCAs and? Mm -hmm. And also uh, colorectal cancer. Colorectal, colorectal cancer. okay. Cancer. All right, fantastic. What about um, a young or a infant male born with a family history of Duchenne? When we test at birth, would that be predictive? Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Although that condition manifests a lot earlier than these cancer conditions or HD that we've been talking about, that is still a predictive test. Okay, in the setting of a positive family history and that male being at risk, we're performing a predictive test. So we'll move on to talking a bit about the pros and cons of offering predictive testing, particularly for those adult onset disorders. Okay, can you think of any reasons, any positive reasons for offering predictive genetic testing? For an adult onset disorder, to improve the quality of the life, also to allow the patient to cope. Okay, all right, good points. Mm -hmm. To make informed choices with regards to management or treatment. Okay. It can also it can be helped with family planning. Family planning. Okay. Early intervention. Early intervention. Early intervention. Early okay. Now, what about a condition for which there is no management or treatment, or for carrier testing where the individual doesn't develop any health related concerns? What are some of the benefits of testing in childhood? Can you think of any? For carrier testing? It will help other family members also. Okay. How will it help other family members? Yeah, because if they are carrier, uh, sure it will be extended to other family members, so they can also say it will be like family planning. It will help 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so let's look at some of the benefits of offering testing. We've mentioned the first one, if there's medical benefits, if there's surveillance or medical intervention available. So we always talk about the example of FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, common colorectal cancer syndrome. You've heard of it before? Which syndrome? FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis. Okay, so with the colorectal cancers, we get two main ones that we often come across. Lynch syndrome, which is the late adult onset disorder, which you may be more familiar with, and FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis, which is of a childhood onset. Okay? Also, um, very high risk of colorectal cancer, and it's actually 100% penetrant in FAP, whereas in Lynch syndrome, it's, depending on which figures you look at, between 60 to 80%. Okay? Now, with this condition, there may be a benefit to actually offering a predictive test early to find out if we should expose that child to yearly colonosco colonoscopic surveillance or perhaps do screening for hepatoblastoma. Okay, so in that situation, yes, there is a reason or a benefit to offering testing earlier than recommended. Um, it may remove the parent's worries. That anxiety or concern may be detrimental to the child. At any sign of a problem, those parents are maybe bringing the child to the hospital, taking the child out of school. Um, you know, anxiety that is extreme, not, not just um, uh, minor anxiety. Maybe that would be a positive reason to offer testing. Um, facilitates planning. We were talking about family, uh, testing other family members, maybe moving to a different area and so forth. Maybe that would be a good reason to screen. We have a test available. Why not take morning Amira? Why not take advantage of that? We could prepare for the future, that's something that we mentioned. And we can ensure vigilance in general health care. Okay? Those may all be good reasons to offer testing before recommendations of it being offered, perhaps more of an adult onset. Or well, how are you? Some of the cons. Can we think of some cons before we go through the list? Some reasons why not to offer predictive testing for an adult onset disorder in childhood. Emotionally, maybe they will cause anxiety yeah. for them. Absolutely. A child, can they deal with that? Do they know what this means for the child? Stress, perhaps, for the adults? Okay. Anything else we can think of? Family stigma, currently. Mm, absolutely. Definitely. I think particularly we've come across a lot of that with our premarital testing and that may also extend into predictive testing in, for, in childhood. Um, we've mentioned the first three. There may be absolutely no benefit to the child knowing at that point in time versus knowing later on when they're more mature to be able to cope with the information. And something that's not a big concern here, but um, Often, in the Western world, a number of individuals would seek medical insurance. And if you've had a genetic test, you have to declare that. And then your premiums will be increased. Okay, so maybe that would also be a reason to not consider testing early. And the most important one is it removes that child's right to decide whether or not they want to be tested. Okay, they have to be actively involved in that decision making. Because that information will never change whether we test in childhood, adolescence, or at the age of 90. Okay, we can never remove it once it is known. So we take that very seriously. And just to accentuate that point, if we look at the interest in uptake of predictive testing, those figures are high, okay, nearing 98%. However, the uptake, the actual uptake of families that will go ahead with testing is about half of that figure. And for conditions where there's no treatment, like HD, those figures are even less than 15%. So just because there's a test available doesn't need, mean that we have to go ahead with that or facilitate it. Okay. The policy guidelines around um, predictive testing, particularly for an adult onset disorder or for carrier testing that has no health implications for the individual, is to defer testing till at least 18 years. And this is agreed upon by the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, 
and the British Society of Human Genetics. So all major genetic groups advocate for not testing before maturity or around the age of 18 years. Now obviously every now and again we'll get a case where we do test at a younger age but there should be a very good reason to offer testing. Perhaps the family needs to make a life-changing decision about if they're going to go live in the mountains where they have minimal access to uh, medical services and that child is at risk of a condition that needs a lot of medical attention or they're going to move to a more city-orientated environment with access. They may need that information to make that decision. Um, debilitating the anxiety on the parent, as we spoke about, you know, constantly bringing that child to the hospital, taking them out of school, worrying about it. The child is now picking up on that anxiety and that's causing a problem. Those types of things we may consider testing earlier, but we would still try and do it at a point where the child was old enough to actively participate in that discussion as far as possible. Okay. That may not necessarily be 18, but we'll try and get it at an age at least where they are mature enough to understand the information and the impact of that information on them. All right. So someone who considers predictive testing, now let's talk specifically about adult onset disorders. Uh, someone who's coming for testing for Lynch syndrome or for BRCA or for Huntington's disease. They may want to have relief from uncertainty or constantly dealing with anxiety. They may be experiencing phantom symptoms and they want to have a certain answer. Okay. They may want to start a surveillance program and this information will be useful to whether or not they initiate it or whether there's no need for it. Future planning. And that fa uh, planning can be family planning, whether or not to start a family, um, whether or not to consider using PGD, whether or not in Western populations to talk about egg or sperm donation or adoption. Um, it may be when they encounter a new relationship they may want to consider predictive testing. If they want to know about their life expectancy, planning for education or employment, maybe a time which promotes them to undergo testing, and if they have children, to maybe find out if those children may or may not be at risk of the particular familial disorder. So these are some of the factors that would motivate someone to come and see you for predictive testing. So we'll discuss two examples. The first one will be Lynch syndrome. We all know about Lynch syndrome. <coughs> Okay, so what is the biggest risk f uh, for these individuals? Colorectal cancer. Okay. Colorectal cancer is the biggest concern. There are other extracolonic cancers. For females, gynecological and colorectal are also the big things. The condition doesn't illustrate 100% penetrance, but there is a high risk up to about 80%. <coughs> okay. And there is effective surveillance. Colonoscopies are usually recommended on an annual basis from 30 years and every two years prior to this and usually about 10 years before the age of the earliest family member developing cancer. Screening is effective. It can reduce the morbidity and mortality by more than half. Okay. So having that background, we come back to our family history and what we can see here is that Halima is now 40. She's our patient. She has a father who developed cancer and died at the age of 45. He had colorectal cancer. His brother also had cancer and died. And his sister also had cancer and also died. She's married and she has two children who are adolescents. Okay. Now, she comes to us, to the clinic, to come and talk about predictive testing for Lynch syndrome. Obviously, we have a known mutation if we're able to offer predictive testing, right? Yeah? Correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? <laughs> okay. So, what are the important things that you need to discuss in your session before you offer her testing? Okay, so let's find out why is she here today, okay? Is it because she's worried or is it for her children? 
Okay, good. We need to find out what's motivating her to come today. Fantastic. Yes, absolutely. How is she going to cope? How does she feel about a positive test? What does that mean for her, particularly in light of this family history of cancer? Mm -hmm. Any other ideas? Okay, let's go through a few things that, from a counselor's point of view, you would particularly try and cover to also ensure informed consent as well as highlight any issues that need to be addressed pre and post test counselling. So we mentioned we need to find out why Halim is here today. What drove her to come today, not yesterday and not five years from now? Did someone die recently? Has she got concerning symptoms? Are her children becoming of the age where they're asking questions? What happened? Okay, why is she there? What's motivating her? We also need to know a little bit about her support system. Did she maybe come with her husband? And I would then possibly anticipate that maybe he's a good source of support for her. Does she come with a family member? Does she come with a friend? Why did she pick that person? And if she came alone, why is she there alone? Okay. What support does she have access to? How much do they talk about cancer? How open are they to discussing it? Is it secretive or not? We know a lot of our families here don't even mention this condition to their spouse. Okay. We know in that situation there's minimal support and that we may need to step in and offer a whole lot more for that. How about how she perceives cancer? What do you think this may have an effect on? That she'll be at higher risk. Okay, she may be very worried because she knows so many people close to her. What has happened with all the individuals that have developed cancer? <coughs> They've passed away. Maybe she views <coughs> cancer as a death sentence, right? What is her perception of it? Mm, absolutely. Maybe she's even more anxious about this <coughs> because of this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'd also want to find out, did they go for surveillance or not? When did they, how, what was their progression of disease like? Because that will give you insight into how she perceives it. Perhaps if they'd gone for surveillance and they'd still died from the cancer, she may not be as adherent to surveillance because she doesn't see that there's any benefit to it. But if they'd never gone for any surveillance, you could focus on the positive aspects and encourage her that, that your picture can be very different because we have a surveillance plan in place. Hmm? How do we think, and we've mentioned this, that she would cope with a positive result? Would she adhere to surveillance or not? How does she feel about what the surveillance is? Colonic preparation, which is not easy, and undergoing a colonoscopy. Okay. <clears throat> does she have the available support to cope with this? And particularly importantly, sorry, how does she perceive discussing this with the children and other family members with regards to that available support? Okay. So all of those issues need to be addressed before going ahead with a genetic test. And why is that so important? Why do we have to address all of this before testing? will offer us insight into how she may cope, how much support she may need. Is she ready to undergo testing? Maybe her father's just died and she's come to us to see us the day after the funeral. Is that really the right time to go through something like this? Is she emotionally capable of thinking about herself while she's grieving for her father? No. So maybe we wa might want to discourage and delay it slightly at that point. So you have to address all of these issues to be able to ensure that you 
put the best um, counselling opportunities forward for her to cope with this information. Adapt the situation like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we see someone for pre-test counselling, we need to get an assessment of the emotional state of that individual. We need to explore the emotional and psychological meaning of the disease. We need to discuss the potential impact of that test result, the impact of a positive and a negative result. <coughs> we need to discuss risk perception. And as we recall from our earlier discussion, factual figures may be very differently perceived to that individual than as we present them. So we need to go and have a sense of how that risk figure makes her feel. That 50% chance of inheriting the disease-causing mutation identified in her father. That 60 to 80% risk of in de then developing cancer. How about the extracolonic cancer risks? How does she feel about that? Again, there's also um, a perception with regards to the specific ages and being at a high or low risk with regards to age and developing each of those cancers and also the perception of passing on this risk to other family members or the risk for her children. So there are a number of risk figures that also need to be covered in, in counselling. You also need to get a sense of how she perceives each of those. And again, family history will have a big effect on how that is perceived. So your pedigree will always remain the golden standard of getting all the information you need, but also a very important psychosocial tool for obtaining insight into all of these factors. Okay. Um, we need to discuss management, surveillance, and if there's any treatment available or future clinical trials. Uh, how is she going to inform the children? And at what stage? And how can you help with that? How is she going to inform the family? And also, what options are available for risk management if she doesn't consider testing? Now, some individuals, we spoke about not everyone actually goes ahead with predictive testing, but that individual should still be declared high risk and be included in the surveillance program. But patients need to be made aware of the fact that even if they don't do this test, what can they do to prevent or try to reduce the chances of developing cancer? So we go ahead, after we've done our pre-test counselling session, we go ahead and we test her and we come back and she carries the same changes in her father. Okay? She's gene positive, she's high risk for Lynch syndrome. What are the type of things that you need to come back and discuss with her at this stage once you've delivered that positive test result? Okay, and we will discuss about how she can receive like this information about her psychology exam, mm -hmm. about the coping mechanism, also how she will inform her mm -hmm. husband, her mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. her relatives about that. Absolutely. Uh, and I will discuss her about the same, the one about the surveillance treatment. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Good. Anything else? How will the test result affect her life? Absolutely. How will it change things for her? We've mentioned coping, what this means for other family members. Brilliant. Okay. Sometimes we prefer, like, especially to be only taught. The communication thoroughly is said to be helped most, more mm -hmm. than anything else. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. only with the one, uh, one uh, class we make the decision, we give a meaning. As, as you feel you want to talk, please go on. Absolutely. So you need to establish a connection for her, especially if she has no support system and an open um, sense of communication that she can come back to if at any stage there are further concerns that maybe weren't significant at that point in time. Okay, support system. So we've picked up on most of the issues here. We need to discuss how she's coping and we may have a bit of insight into this from our pre-test counselling session. We may anticipate she can cope or she may not be able to cope. We need to um, talk about surveillance, okay, and is she going to be adherent to this or not. We need to discuss how she's going to divulge this information to her children. Can we help with that? Is it going to be difficult or easy? And how her family is going to be informed about this. They're all at 50% risk of inheriting the same mutation. They're all high risk. 
Does she speak to all of them? Do they live nearby? Is it going to be easy or difficult? How can we help with that? Um, do we need to provide her with information letters and so forth? Okay. That will all depend on the particular scenario that you're facing with that patient and her communication and family dynamics. And you need insight into that to be able to deal with it in this session. Okay. Good. All right, so let's move on to our second example. Let's talk a bit about uh, predictive testing for a condition for which there's no treatment. So something like Huntington's disease. So we've raised that a few times this morning already. What do we know about this condition? It's adult onset. Full penetrance. No treatment available. Okay. Good. So, we see um, Khaled, he's a young gentleman, he comes to us to talk about predictive testing. And looking at his family history, he has a father who's 67, who died, he was genetically confirmed to have Huntington's disease, and his brother Mohammed and his sister Aisha have both been to us previously for genetic testing, and they've both tested positive. And he's got a young daughter of two years. Okay, what are the areas that we need to focus in on during our counselling session? So what are they? To direct his employment, so we discuss because he can miss his job anytime. He's working The test is not going to make that difference. The family history will be something. Mm -hmm. Good. So one of the things we need to look into is what's happening with these siblings. They're asymptomatic. How are they coping? What motivated them to come? Did they coerce him to come today? Was it his own choice? What has driven him to come here today? Was it because his father recently died or a diagnosis has recently been made? He's had a child, the child is two years old already. What, is there anything that spurred it on from that point of view? Is there pressure from his spouse? What is the reason he's here today? Okay, what else? You mentioned employment and that type of thing. Maybe we should find out how he perceives coping with a positive test result. How will life change for him? Will he still have the support of his wife? Is he worried about divorce? Hmm? Not easy. So we need to find out why he's here. We need to look at the disease impression. We may think it's a devastating condition, but we need to find out if he views it the same. Interestingly, a lot of families that I dealt with in South Africa felt that it was a family condition. It was devastating, yes, but it was something that the family took care of and looked after. So if they were going to be positive, they knew that someone would look after them. So for them, receiving that information may be a little bit less concerning than for another family. Okay. So you need to get a sense of it, how that is perceived from your patient's point of view, not how you interpret it will be for them. Okay. What effect may this have? Are there any concerns of the effect on that relationship? And what will this mean? Is he worried about his daughter and the risk of it being passed on to her? And will this have any influence on them having future children or not? Okay. Why now? And how is it going to make any difference to him? Okay, so he's tested. And this is a few months later. At, or let's say a few months to a few years later and his two siblings are now affected or they've started showing symptoms okay and he receives the test results and he's not a carrier he's not at risk of developing HD okay what are the important things that we need to deal with in this session Anxiety 
Okay, so we expect his anxiety to be removed, but we need to also keep an open mind and find out if how he perceives a negative result. And that would have come from our previous discussion. Maybe this is difficult for him to hear as well. Okay, we expect him to be happy, excited, be able to move on with life. And how would it affect his relationship with his Absolutely. Now, he's got two affected. He's unaffected. He's the only one that's unaffected. He's going to become the primary caregiver for those individuals. Will that have a financial burden on him and his wife and his children? That will definitely have an emotional burden on them. Do they have to stay close to those family members to continue that responsibility? Maybe they were planning to go overseas. Now that decision making has to come into play as well. So although we expect relief, there may be a lot of other factors we still need to deal with for that patient. Um, all right. Okay, so I hope you get the general sense of why that predictive testing is so important before we uh, enter into genetic testing and before we discuss that test result and whether that test result is positive or even if it is negative. Okay. All right, so we'll finish off by discussing predictive testing protocols. Um, the one that everything is based on is the one that was developed for Huntington's disease. However, for the other conditions like Lynch syndrome, where there is a degree of intervention available or medical management, they're not as stringent um, or not as extensive as the protocol for HD. All right. So this was developed in or published in 1994, and the uptake for predictive testing for Huntington specifically is only in the range of 4.5 to 15 percent. So the large majority of individuals at risk of HD do not come for predictive testing. Furthermore, the dropout rate is also high. So even if an individual approaches us for testing, there's a high chance that they may not continue throughout the protocol. Okay. Um, has anyone had any experience of HD? Haven't seen any cases? Okay. So you joined there. For testing. Fantastic. That would have been very good exposure, I'm sure. Mm. Were you ever with a patient throughout the entire session? Yes. Okay. And they went through with it? It's a lengthy process, and we'll, we'll go through a little more of the details as well. But as you've mentioned, there are a number of appointments involved, and they're usually spaced out um, mostly about a month apart, but that can be um, changed depending on the patient needs. Um, you do send them to a psychological mm -hmm. mm. yes, Very importantly. So there you, had, you probably had access to someone who was familiar with HD. What I found here is that um, I think maybe let's focus more on your experience and then I can give you a bit of my experience, but how did you feel going through that with your patient? They're all writing a paper now on their uptake, but I think it's higher mm -hmm. than what's published. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. There are so many interesting people, but uptake mm -hmm. is still low, but it's better than mm -hmm. other places, so mm -hmm. they're still hoping to continue with the same approach. Okay. So they feel for them it's a very effective yes. protocol that they're utilizing. And for your patient, did they end up being positive or negative? The only one I saw was negative. Was negative. Yes. And how did that go? She was happy. She was so different than the first time they saw her. So for her it was worthwhile going through the whole thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's not an easy thing to be involved with for the person who's doing the predictive testing uh, protocol as well as for the patient going through testing themselves. Um, there are a number of individuals involved and we'll discuss that that would also act as support. Um, I've 
been approached by three different individuals. None of them have continued through the program. Okay, so we have a number of families here. Um, I don't know the exact details, but a few tribes um, that are at risk of HD. So we definitely see the condition as you would throughout the world. And um, it hasn't been very easy setting up a protocol because there isn't an existing one, but we've adapted it to the one that I used to work with. And we've tried to get psychologists and neurologists involved as well. But again, those individuals have limited um, interaction with individuals with HD. So their insight may not be as good perhaps as the individuals that you were working with. And it takes time to establish that service, but it's nonetheless a very important service that needs to be developed. Okay. So we'll go back to a few more details of this um, protocol itself. There are four meetings, three or four, depending on the preference of the centre. Um, usually the first session, with regards to counselling, you're looking at exploring the motives. Why now? Why do you want to undergo testing? What is your expectations of this? You provide them with information on HD, particularly for those individuals where that family member may have passed away when they were a lot younger or no longer living with them where they don't have insight into the condition itself. Uh, it's important to explain how genetic testing will be undertaken, what the possible outcomes would be, what a positive result would tell us. So here, greater than 39, CAG repeats, 100% penetrant, you will develop HD, but we can't tell you at what age. But you will develop it. Okay. Negative results, you won't develop it. What would something uninterpretable be? Or where we are more, um, where we can't give a clear answer? Do you know about the different zones? Don't worry about listing the numbers, but do you know what categories they fall into? So we have a definite non-HD category, we have a definite HD category, and then we have two further categories. Okay? We have intermediate and we have zone of reduced penetrance. Now, uninterpretable would possibly fall within zone of reduced penetrance, which is a repeat size that tells us that individual is at risk, but we don't know if they will or will not develop HD. Okay? And that is often perhaps even harder for patients to live with than having a clear negative or positive result. So they need to be counseled on that possibility as well. Okay. We also have the in intermediate um, uh, indeterminate sorry, uh, zone, which means that that individual will not be at risk of HD, but their children could develop HD. Okay. Now, particularly if it's paternally transmitted, we may be worried about anticipation, anticipation and getting a, a high risk for that child. Okay. So all of these issues, again, need to be covered in the context of the HD discussion. And this is something that won't necessarily be known to a family even if they are very familiar with HD. All right. They may view that test result as either a definite answer of yes or a definite answer of no. Um, and importantly, obtaining confirmation in an affected. Why do we need to confirm HD in a family member before we offer predictive testing for HD? Why is it important to do this step? Absolutely. Okay. If you're going to offer a predictive test for HD and you haven't confirmed it and that test comes back normal, okay? No expanded repeats. We tell that individual they're not at risk of HD. But that family history was something like a spina cerebellar ataxia or HD like one or two. They could still develop that condition, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's very important to make sure that there are no other differential diagnoses that we need to consider. So always genetically confirm in and affected before you offer. Always go and seek out 
that test on that affected individual before you start the discussion of predictive testing. Okay. Um, second meeting, uh, again, usually we advocate that that individual comes and sees us with a support partner and we strongly urge that that, that that person joins and if they don't have that person, we might nominate someone as a support partner from the genetic team. Did your patient bring her husband or uh, another family member? She came alone. And was there someone nominated for her as a support partner? Perhaps one of the genetic nurses or... She should have someone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So some of the cases that I've seen, again, they didn't want to bring any of their family members with. They brought a friend with. So some family members will bring a, a family member, and usually that would be a, if the husband's coming, perhaps his wife may come with, uh, or vice versa. But usually for single people, they may not necessarily want people to know that they're coming. Perhaps their parent has decided that they don't want to know themselves, but the child does, so they can't tell a family member about it. Although that has another implication with regards to if you find out that child's result, you by way most likely going to find out uh, the at-risk adults as well. So there are a lot of ethical issues that you also need to deal with in that situation. Um, a psychological assessment has to be done at this stage, and a neurological assessment. Okay, and usually if they very subtle signs of HD, um, one wouldn't really disclose it at this stage, you'd still put it through as a predictive test. But if it was obviously HD, then that predictive testing protocol doesn't have to be followed and you can just put it through as a diagnostic test. So there's no need for the six month workup um, in someone who's got symptoms of HD. Okay. Then the third session is where the individual comes for the blood sampling. They've now heard about it, we've found out what their motivation is, they're ready to be tested, they're ready to face whether or not they're positive or negative. And the fourth session is when we discuss the test results. We see if there's um, how they're going to adjust to that information, if there's any need for further psychological um, counselling. And again, the counsellor is not equipped to deal with the need for uh, psychosocial counselling. Okay, we equipped to be able to recognise the signs and symptoms of whether or not it's needed. We can deal with family dynamics, family issues related to the condition, but if there's a need for psychological intervention, we do not have the expertise to do that. Okay, and that's when you refer to a psychotherapist. All right. And follow-up is usually one month after result delivery, just to see how they've adapted, how they're coping, do we need to arrange further follow-up? You were particularly pointing to that point that at least they've got someone to contact if there's a need for some other issue further down the line. They have a number. Okay. So it's not an easy thing and there's a definite need for counselling for any form of predictive testing, whether it's HD or even for a condition for which there is medical intervention. So in summary, when we're counselling for these um, protocols, we need to ensure that the patient understands the medical facts of that particular condition, that they understand how diagnosis is made, what the prognosis would be, if there's surveillance or management available. They need to appreciate the impact of the test outcome psychologically as well as physically. And they also need to note that that information is not just limited to an effect on them, but will influence others. We need to figure out how best to approach those other at-risk individuals. We need to help them anticipate how they're going to react to a favourable or unfavourable result. And again, remember, a favourable result may not always be a posit uh, negative result. Sometimes a favourable result could be a positive result, although we may not view it that way. Okay. We need to choose a course of action after disclosure. 
what is going to happen if you test positive? Are you going to undergo surveillance or not? If you don't undergo surveillance, do you realize what the risks are? When are you going to undergo surveillance? Are we going to do it this year? Perhaps you're pregnant, we can't offer a colonoscopy this year. We've skipped it for two years, we have to organize it for next year. We need to put a plan in place for that patient. We need to also do counseling with regards to the family ethical and religious standards for that individual. And we need to ensure that we can help them make the best possible adjustment. Okay. All right, so that's all that I wanted to cover today. Are there any other questions? A minimum of a month, I would say. No, <laughs> definitely not. They fight it. But for the ones that I've seen in South Africa and the ones that I've seen here, those that have gone through the program have been very happy with that time interval. And those that have stepped out of the program have agreed to those monthly sessions after a lengthy discussion of it, but then decided that it was not in their best interest at that point in time to continue. So no, people are very hesitant mm -hmm. or very upset to know that it's going to take so long. They want to be tested now and they want the result tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But once one has a detailed discussion about the benefit of each of the steps and why that time period has been chosen, most of the time in all cases that I've seen, they've come around and they've agreed to that. And as I've said, all the cases that have gone through the program have been very happy that it was done in that way mm -hmm. and that it was not shortened. And usually when you say, this is how it is, or you don't go through the system. But there's a, the greater harm is if someone goes for a test and they're not quite ready to cope with a positive result. They have to be prepared. Mm. They've lived for 25 years without knowing what is six months going to do. But if they test and they're not ready to cope with it or they don't actually want to know that information or they haven't been able to think it through, that's going to have far more of a negative psychological effect on them. And then what about the family they must have, they must have known about the patient? Yeah, it's difficult. We spoke about the situation where that individual is working in an environment where there's harm to others. So if we leave that situation, we talk about that individual Okay, it's their choice whether or not they want to inform the family of their test result. Okay, because there's no treatment, there's no surveillance, there's nothing that can be done in the in HD. If it was for Lynch syndrome, that's a different situation. There, you need to push for disclosure. Okay, and again, if they don't want to tell, if if Halima doesn't want to tell her siblings about it. I would try my absolute best to at least get a letter, a general letter, even that she can drop off in their post office or an address that we can mail to them so that there's no connection between her and the disclosure to inform them that they're from a family that is high risk, no names need to be mentioned and there is surveillance available that will reduce the risk and we encourage them to come and see us to obtain further information. At least they know, and it's then their decision if they come and see us or not. We can't force them to come to see us, but we need to make sure that that information is carried across. And for Lynch syndrome, we wouldn't be as lengthy. You wouldn't have the month between each of the appointments. You'd have a pre-test counselling session and taking of the sample and a post-test counselling session. Um, protocols have been adapted and have been a lot shorter for other manageable conditions. Okay, it's just for HD that we stick to these stringent guidelines. You will find centres that offer it in a shorter period of time, but I don't know of any research where that has been um, in the best interest of the patient. Okay, to show that those cases have less anxiety than the ones that go through the recommended protocol. But you're absolutely right, patients come to us and they're not very happy about the situation. They might, because some patients, they come at the late stage, they might not be 
technologically fit for the mm -hmm. new decisions that are taken the news. So this stepwise approach mm -hmm. is very good to prepare them because they have been suicidal attempts and depression, lots of complications. So there's no bargaining. Mm -hmm. And for few of the patients, the psychological um, behavioral changes, the personality changes are can be the first of the symptoms to manifest. Mm -hmm. And people wouldn't necessarily pick up on that um, until the career happens. So you need to make sure that that patient is safe and capable of dealing with this knowledge. And if the psychologist, that's why there's that psychological intervention, if the psychologist feels that this patient can't cope with this information, they will stop testing at that point in time. They won't continue to do testing until they feel that that patient has the ability to cope with it. If there's a risk for suicide, we won't go through with it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would like to know what kind of support from psychologists they will give to them if they give reference to psychologists. But as my information, I don't think it will be that much useful. They only they will give them just talk. Just express your feeling, express your worry, your anxious, your stress. Unless it exists uh, exist more than Six months that time they will interfere with the medication. But often talking through something is makes yeah. a big difference in itself. It released, but, in, but the disease itself it will be continued forever. Mm. It will not be that much. It's still you are worry and worry and worry. But they will. If they have somebody mm. in the family, they saw it in front of them. Mm. I will be saying like that one. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, you can't, you can't get rid of that concern or worry, but you can equip your patient with skills to dealing with that worry so that it doesn't become detrimental to them, so that they don't become at risk of suicide, mm -hmm. so that they have someone to contact if they feel that they can't face mm -hmm. that anymore. Or not even, they may not even verbalize it, but the psychologist has very special skills in terms of picking up on it, which we aren't equipped to do. Mm -hmm. You need a psychotherapist, not just any psychologist. They train very differently. It's an expertise in terms of the training that they've acquired. Great, thank you. It was very nice to have some perspective from Dublin as well. <laughs> very interesting.